Welcome to the May 2022 meeting of the Humanist Society of Santa Barbara. My name is Judy Flattery. I'm the president uh, of the society and the editor of the newsletter. I want to welcome everyone who's members and those of you who are not members uh, for spending this time with us today. If you're interested, you like what you see, we welcome you to become a member. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can see this talk as well as 50 other talks which we've uh, had before this one. And you can stay informed of our events on our meetup site. Today, we're featuring Dr. Roger Friedman speaking about seeing into the cold, the story of NASA and the European Space Agency's James Webb Space Telescope, JWST. It's the largest space telescope ever built. It's now in permanent orbit around the sun. And in this talk today, Dr. Friedman will explain the purpose of the telescope, how is it different from other telescopes like Hubble, and what do astronomers hope to learn from it. Dr. Friedman is an emeritus teaching professor of physics at UCSB. He is co-author of several textbooks on astronomy and physics. Yep. Now this one on the left, Sears and Zemanski University Physics 4th Edition, I think that's the textbook that I used in my freshman physics class back in the uh, late 70s. And then it was Sears and Zemanski. And now, I don't know if this is the current one, 15th edition. It is, yes. Sears and Zemanski has just a small font at the top. And I noticed that you have a much larger font in the lower right-hand corner. So on behalf of physics students everywhere, thank you for keeping this up to date. Because uh, as we say, uh, you know, things happen for a reason. And the reason is generally physics. So in addition to being the co-author of several textbooks, uh, you're currently working on an educational comic book for physics students, which I'm very interested in that. And we're involved in the initial uh, San Diego Comic-Con, now the world's largest popular cultural convention. So somebody might say, well, what does humanism have to do with telescopes? Why are we talking about telescopes at a humanist society meeting? So I looked at the uh, affirmations of humanism by Paul Kurtz to see where is there a connection. And I found three, three affirmations that relate. One is, as humanists, we're committed to the application of reason and science to the understanding of the universe and the solving of human problems. We believe that scientific discovery and technology can contribute to the betterment of human life. And we are citizens of the universe and are excited by the discoveries still to be made in the cosmos. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Roger. Thank you for being our speaker this month. All right, thanks very much. And thanks everyone for being here. I really appreciate uh, your, your spending a lovely Saturday afternoon with me. So again, as advertised, I want to talk about this notion of seeing into the cold, the story of the JWST Space Telescope. And again, I'm, I'm uh, still associated with UCSB. The nice thing is after you retire, uh, you still, still keep your UCSB email address, in my case, airboy at ucsb.edu. So feel free to email with any questions. And kind of perversely, your parking permit is free after you retire when you don't actually need it anymore. I suppose <laughs> that makes sense to somebody, but there you go. So, so today we're really talking about JWST. And this is a wonderful artist illustration of what the, the uh, telescope looks like uh, when it's actually deployed on space. This guy was actually launched just last Christmas day. But if you, if you actually do a search for when will JWST launch and, and you make the search wide enough, you'll see what's saying, oh, expected the launch sometimes in 2016 expected the launch sometimes in 2011 and so on. This project's been going on for a long time, lots of delays, people wanted to make sure they got it right. And in fact, uh, where this all started uh, was actually really quite a long time ago. Uh, the first study of this first conference about the next generation space telescope, designed as the follow on to the Hubble Space Telescope that dates from 1989. To show you how far in advance NASA was thinking, uh, space telescope wouldn't be launched for another two years. So they're already thinking about what was going to be the telescope after it. But, and you might ask, why do they call it the next generation one? This is actually, while Star Trek, the next generation was actually in first run. And I guarantee you that if the if people at NASA or anything like the people at UCSB, they were all watching the show themselves. So it is kind of, and of course now we think of that, oh, that's, that's a show from so long ago, and really is a third of a century ago. Uh, there are people who literally have spent their entire careers uh, just on JWST and, and actually getting it up there. One of the first things we notice about this amazing telescope is that it's big. You can't really tell from this illustration. So here's a, actually a full-size model 
of JDOC with a bunch of folks from NASA Goddard actually standing around. And the thing is absolutely huge. Uh, the mirror back there is six and a half meters across, about 24 feet. Huge telescope, as Judy mentioned. It's not only one of the largest telescopes ever built, it's, it's certainly the largest telescope ever placed in orbit. And as you can imagine, putting up there was really quite an adventure. Perhaps not surprising it took a third of a century to make it work. Another key feature about uh, JWC, besides being big, is that it's really far away. Of course, created here on Earth and fired off into space. Remember, you think of putting something into space, you think of putting it into low Earth orbit. That, for instance, is where the Hubble Space Telescope is. And the reason that was done for the Hubble Space Telescope was that it was intended that it would be serviceable by the space shuttle, which, in fact, it needed to be for a variety of reasons. But JWST is actually much farther away. In fact, here's its current position. In this illustration, you'll see the Earth, 150 million kilometers or I think there's a few backward third world countries that use miles. I can't think of the name of any of those right now, but 93 million miles from Earth to Sun, and where JWST is about 1% farther from the Sun than Earth is, uh, one and a half million kilometers out there, 930,000 miles, and it's not at but orbiting a point in the sky, L2. The cool thing about the point cat L2 is that if you had an object placed right at L2, the combined gravitational pull of the Sun and the Earth since they're both, Sun and Earth are both on, on your same side, they both be pulling you inward, is exactly enough to keep you going in an orbit around the Sun with a period of exactly one year. In other words, you would always remain so that the Sun, Earth, and L2 are always in a line with each other, which means that this spacecraft is always in the same direction as seen from Earth. It's always exactly opposite in the sky from where the Sun is. And as we'll see, there's some tremendous advantages to that. Because of where it is, JWT is both really hot and also really cold. The underside of the spacecraft, as you see it here, always faces the sun, and the top side, which has the huge telescope mirrors on it, is always facing away from the sun. As a result of that, that's why I say it's hot and cold. The hot side uh, is an average temperature of 185 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 85 Celsius, so it's really baking. You, you actually could warm up your lunch very effectively on the back side of JWST. That's also where the solar panel is, where all the energy comes to make this work, absorb the communications antenna that points back toward Earth, onboard computer, steering stuff, and so on. But all the scientific stuff is on the cold side. And at very low temperatures, 388 below zero Fahrenheit, negative 233 Celsius, that's colder than liquid nitrogen. Uh, the stuff that, that you might have had encounters with at the dermatologist and the reason it has to be so cold, it turns out, is because of the kind of telescope it is. As you imagine, it places all kinds of technological challenges. It means you have to have devices that work in these ridiculously cold temperatures and don't freeze up while they're doing it. The reason why it has all these bizarre properties, why it's so far away, why it's so big, and why it has to be kept really cold is because it's an infrared telescope. So let me explain what that actually means. If we talk about waves in general, and light is an example of a wave, you have this notion of waves are things that oscillate up and down. Uh, for light, it's, it's electric and magnetic fields, but we don't have to worry about that. That's another lecture altogether. And the distance in a wave from one peak to the next peak is called the wavelength. So for instance, a typical ocean wave, the wavelength might be a few feet or a few meters. If you make the wavelength short, it's gonna look like this. If you make the wavelength long, it's gonna look like that. It turns out different colors of light, what we're really perceiving when we see lights of different colors is that those lights actually have different wavelengths. The kind of wavelengths you deal with for light and also for infrared are on the kind of scale shown here, where the units I'm using, using the Greek letter mu, is a micrometer, sometimes called a micron, and that's one one thousandth of a millimeter. So very, very small distance associated with those. And notice I'm using a scale where every interval in here corresponds to a tenfold increase in wavelength. So you have really short wavelengths over on the left, really longer wavelengths by contrast over on the right. Well, the range that your eye can see, the so-called visible range, is from about 0.4 to about 0.8 micrometers, a very small range uh, from one to the other. But obviously, we can see a tremendous amount with that. But you might ask, are there wavelengths beyond that that might be useful? And there certainly are wavelengths that are shorter than that are ultraviolet. Those are ones, again, think of the dermatologist. Those are the ones that will actually cause sun tanning and sun burns as well. Whereas on the long wavelength side is infrared. And you actually use infrared, for instance, whenever you use a conventional oven, the energy that comes out of the heating elements is mostly in the form of infrared radiation, 
and that's what produces the heat to produce the delicious dinners that you're probably already thinking about as this talk is going along. The human eye can't see all of that, but it turns out JWST can't. Like JWST is designed principally to see in the infrared. It sees a little bit into the visible part of the spectrum at about 0.6 uh, micrometers, but can see all the way to 28 micrometers. And you might say, okay, that's awesome, that's cool, but why would you do that? What's the advantages of, of having a telescope that's optimized for working, not at visible wavelengths, but for infrared wavelengths? So let's think about the difference between what you'd see if you look at something using visible light and infrared light. So here's a photograph of a gentleman standing there who for some apparent reason is holding a black trash bag over his hand. Exactly the same sort of black trash bag you can buy at the grocery store. You'll notice in this picture, the light you're seeing him by is not light that he himself is giving out, it's light that's reflected from the lighting in the room where this photograph was taken. And in fact, unless you look at a light source like a lamp or the sun or the moon or what have you, in fact, even when you're looking at the moon, you're looking at reflected sunlight. And when I'm looking at this person, I'm really seeing the reflection of light off that person. And you notice, for instance, his eyeglasses are transparent, but that black bag is opaque. What would happen if you look at this exact same person using an infrared camera, a camera that, like JWST, is sensitive to infrared wavelengths longer than what your eye can detect? Same person, same pose, infrared camera. So what do you notice? First of all, you notice his eyeglasses have now become opaque. The infrared light can't get through glass at all. But notice, it's like that black bag wasn't there. The, the compounds, the chemical compounds within the black bag that make it, trans, make it opaque, infrared goes right through them. So infrared light has the amazing property that can penetrate certain kinds of materials that visible light could not. Also, the other cool thing you notice is that really the, this infrared camera is using is, a, is acting as a temperature sensor. The light you're seeing here is not reflected light, it's actually light coming from the person himself. Notice how his face is glowing. That's actually infrared radiation that he's emitting because of his skin temperature. And in fact, some physicians use this as a diagnostic technique to look for uh, deficiencies in blood circulation. They'll take an infrared photograph, say, of the hand, and they see areas that where they're getting less infrared radiation that says, well, that area is cold. That says you're getting poor circulation. There. So you're actually seeing energy that's emitted. By contrast, you can see that the colder parts are giving off less radiation as, as well. But again, it's remarkable that, that the infrared can go right through certain materials to which visible light is otherwise opaque. Here's an astronomical example of that. Here's a famous photograph that I think a lot of people have seen of what are sometimes called the pillars of creation. This is an area in a star forming region called the Eagle Nebula or just the serial number M16. That's about 6,500 light years away. And we'll come back to that later, but the meaning of a light year is it's a unit of distance such that Something that's one light year away is so far away that light would take you one year to go from that object to you. So this thing you're seeing as it actually was 6,500 years ago or somewhere around the year 4,500 BC, which is pretty amazing. You'll see these tremendous gas clouds that are glowing with some stars in there, but you'll notice these three vertical pillars, one of which look like it's a boot that's being absconded with over there at the right, they seem to be opaque because there's dust in there that is opaque to visible light. It turns out some of those compounds and dust are very similar chemically to what you actually had in that black plastic bag in the previous picture. And that's why if you look at that same region with the infrared telescope, you see something like this. You can still see where the gas clouds are there, but all of a sudden you can see many more clouds that are either behind those gas clouds or embedded within them. And in fact, those stars that are embedded within them are thought to be stars that are actually forming out of the gas. Our notion of how stars form is that within gas clouds like this, the clouds begin to compress inward under their own mutual gravitational pull. When they reach a certain level, get sufficiently dense nuclear reactions start at the center and they become stars. So we're actually seeing stars in the process of formation here. One thing that's missing in this picture is the sense of scale. The arrow I put it over on the right-hand side, so that, that dimension on the Eagle Nebula, that's about five light years across. So this thing is huge. It's a tremendous region, lots of stars forming. Star formation is really important. We'll actually come back to that later for astronomers in general. So again, infrared telescopes really cool. As you can see though, certain things are opaque to visible light and transparent for infrared and vice versa. Glass in particular has the interesting property that it's similar to the Earth's atmosphere. Glass, you can see right through it. The atmosphere, you can see right through it with visible light. But infrared, unfortunately, is also like glass in that 
just as infrared light does not go through that person's glasses, you can't see their eyes behind them. The same thing is true for the Earth's atmosphere. It's opaque to infrared light, which means if you want to have a telescope that can detect infrared light coming from distant objects in the heavens, keeping it on the ground is a bad idea. It, it would be the same as trying to see through the, t take photographs with the lens cap still on. So instead, if you want to make infrared images of things in the heavens, you need to put that telescope above the atmosphere and now you can see why we need telescopes in space. And in particular, you can see why you need an infrared telescope in space and why JWST, if you're gonna build an infrared telescope, has to be above the Earth's atmosphere. It also has other advantages being above the atmosphere. You never have to worry about clouds. Also this beautiful phenomenon where you see stars twinkle because of variations in the atmosphere. Looks pretty to the naked eye, drives astronomers nuts uh, because it blurs out your images. If you're above the atmosphere, all that blurring has gone away and you can get much, much sharper images. And I'll show you some examples of those later on. Here's a problem though with putting an infrared telescope even in, out in space is the problem is that if you build an infrared telescope that's at room temperature, similar to the temperature of a human body, it's gonna glow itself, which is kind of ridiculous. If you wanted to build a visible light telescope, you wouldn't go oh, put it in a fire so it would glow cherry red thereby ruining all the exposures you're trying to make. Say, no, don't, don't let that happen. Keep the telescope barrel cold. And the same thing is true here for an infrared telescope. If you want to be able to take pictures of these objects out in space using in, infrared wavelengths, you don't want the telescope itself to be glowing in the infrared. And the way to get around that is to cool the telescope down. So an infrared telescope has to be kept cold. The colder something is, the less it glows. Think about the difference between putting a heating element on an electric range at a high level compared to a low level, the lower it is, the less infrared it gives off. You can see less glow coming from it at visible wavelengths as well. And the same thing is true here for a telescope. To keep it from glowing and ruining your images, you gotta keep that telescope cold. There have been previous infrared telescopes. Uh, Herschel, so to the left, which is from the European Space Agency, and Spitzer on the right from NASA. Uh, and there they actually keep them cold, they carry it on board refrigerators. And they used liquid helium for cooling. Uh, liquid helium is four degrees above absolute zero Celsius. And it's ridiculously cold. But, and it works really great for keeping the telescope and the instruments that venture the light uh, as cold as possible. The problem with a refrigerant like that is eventually it runs out. And since these telescopes are out in space, and these are placed per, also very far away that no spacecraft can get to them, when the liquid helium is gone, you're, sort of, you're out of business. So Spitzer, for instance, the liquid helium ran out after about five years. Um, they kept it running for about another 15 after that because they're able to say, okay, we can still see at wavelengths that are just a little bit into the infrared because there we don't need quite so much cooling, but the longer wavelengths, including the ones for which JWST is optimized, uh, there was no way it could work for that when it got into its warm period. And, but Spitzer actually, we definitely got our money's worth out of that one. It's lost, I think, in 2003, and they kept observing with it until 2020. So, but again, you, you're always gonna be time limited because of that refrigerant. So for JWST, they said, let's not do that. Let's use a different technique. Let's get most of our cooling actually by passively just using a sun shield. And it turns out the sun shield is really the equivalent of putting on sunscreen. I, I believe the number is that it turns out to be equivalent to about SPF 1000. So it's a really good sun shield, sun shield there. And you can see it's huge for one thing, uh, that's what provides the difference between the hot side and the cold side. The fact you're able to drop the temperature by something on the order of 500 Fahrenheit degrees difference between the hot side and the cold side or more simply because that's a very efficient heat shield. So how does that sun shield actually work? Well, first thing you notice is it's big. Uh, you saw that from the previous picture. It has about the same area as a regulation tennis court. And you might be wondering, how did they build a launch vehicle large enough to get, get something the size of a tennis court into space? The answer is they didn't. This thing actually folded up in a very ornate fashion and then unfolded in a very ornate fashion uh, over a process of several weeks once it actually got out into space and happily everything worked uh, because if it hadn't worked, if something would have gotten stuck along the way, we're kind of out of luck because this thing is so far out there, we had, there's no way any human spacecraft had actually get out there. But happily, the engineers worked and 33 years of design and building and all that worked out super well. Uh, 
it's the sun shield is not just a single layer like a parasol. It's actually five layers of this really it's this material called Kapton, uh, developed actually back in the 80s or 90s, and which has the ability a that it folds up really well. It's super lightweight. Lightweight is always important when you're trying to get something into space because any time you can shave a gram off your spacecraft is going to save you money in, in um, just the cost of getting it into space. Uh, but also, you know, it's also very reflective. And so part of the, the drill here is being able to reflect sunlight, but you'll notice it has these five layers. So why do you need five layers to do that with a gap between them? And the notion is that when the first layer gets hit, up, hit by sun, it of course is going to get heated up as we saw that, that layer's temperature several hundred degrees Fahrenheit, which means it itself is gonna give off infrared radiation. Well, some of that infrared ra radiation will then bounce off the next layer and actually go out the sides. In other words, you naturally cool this guy off by sending some of the energy off to the side. That's gonna warm up the second layer somewhat, but it's gonna dissipate some of its energy by infrared radiation that bounces off the third layer of the sun shield and then goes out the side and so on. So by doing this multi-layer approach and getting rid of the heat progressively from one side to the other, that's how you can sustain this super low temperatures on the far side compared to the near side. There's a little bit of liquid helium they use for one of the instruments on board JWST, but, um, but the, the lion's share of the cooling is done in this really cool passive fashion. It, it's really quite an amazing piece of technology. And the cool thing is no moving parts. As I mentioned, JWST is out of this point called L2. The reason we put out there is you might think, oh, it's further from the sun, so it's gonna be cooler. Well, you're only about 1% further away from the sun than we are on Earth, which means the intensity of sunlight is only about half a percent less. So that's not really the big effect. The big effect you're getting by putting out JWST is you wanna make sure that you're always shielded from the sun to so keep the, solar, the sun shield always facing toward the sun and the telescope itself on the cold side, that would not be possible if you were, say, in Earth orbit, because in Earth orbit, uh, orbiting there, you'd have these issues where sometimes you'd pass into the Earth's shadow. And if you're inside the Earth's shadow, then there's uh, be some temperature changes, and you want to keep the temperature of JWST absolutely as stable as possible. So that would be a bad idea as well. There's also the issue that just the Earth itself gives off light as does the moon, just reflected sunlight. And that's frankly enough that it could interfere with the optics. But where JWST is, it, that sun shield not only blocks out light from the sun, it also completely blocks out light from the earth and it completely blocks out, blocks out light from the moon. Also it means that while you're observing, the earth and the moon never get in the way for a, a telescope in low earth orbit, like the Hubble Space Telescope. Occasionally the earth frankly gets in the way of what you're trying to look at, as does the moon. So they have to schedule around that where JWST is, it doesn't have a problem. That point about the way they don't actually sit at L2, if it was there, sometimes it would get into the Earth's shadow, so instead it actually orbits around that point. It turns out that point isn't a, a perfectly stable point for stuff to orbit, which is good because that means there's no space debris there that might get in the way. Every, every so often I have to do a little bit of correction. So there's a little bit of propellant on board JWST, and that'll run out eventually, but it should be able to operate for at least for five to 10 years without needing any maintenance whatsoever, which is pretty amazing. The most important part of JWST, of course, is not the sun shield, as cool as that might be, but it's the telescope itself. And the telescope, as you mentioned earlier, it's the largest telescope ever put into space. Uh, the main mirror, which is the device that collects all the light, the so-called primary mirror, six and a half meters, about 21 feet, four inches in diameter. And why does that have to be so big? Uh, really for two reasons. One is, if you go out at night, you'll notice, huh, those stars, they're, they're pretty dim. And in fact, at night, your eyes open up to accommodate that. And the same principle that's actually used uh, by any, any time you go out at night, uh, what happens, your eyes actually open up to accommodate things, to get as much light energy as possible. So you in order to collect as much light as you can from distant objects in space, you want basically the biggest bucket you can to collect all that uh, very faint light coming from space. Also, it turns out the bigger the diameter of the mirror, the sharper the images can be. So by having that as big as possible, the better off you are. Here's a nice comparison between the size of the JWST primary mirror and the Hubble primary mirror. Hubble mirror is only about two and a half meters across, 
JWST much bigger. You'll notice that whereas the Hubble mirror was a single piece, here there's actually 18 pieces. Why did they do that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is this way they could fold it up so it could fit in a smaller volume in order to actually send it out into space. The other one is this way with the individual pieces, it's easier to make a bunch of small pieces that have exactly the right optical shape. And then to get perfect focusing, each one of those segments is independently adjustable to a dimension that's a fraction the width of a human hair. They can do some incredibly fine focusing. And interesting, incidentally, the company that built all that was Ball, the same people to make the mason jars. They branched out a little bit since they started off in that business. That same company also built the mirror for the Hubble Space Telescope. And they made, learned a nasty lesson from Hubble. With Hubble, that mirror, they grounded to exactly the right shape, but it turns out they grounded to exactly the wrong shape. So it's perfectly shaped, but it was, it was literally out of focus. So they had to go in, actually, with the space shuttle and bring up some corrective lenses, corrective mirrors, actually, to adjust the focus on Hubble. Uh, they said, we, let's not let that happen again with JWST. That's why they played it smart. So let's make the whole thing adjustable. And it's actually worked out super well. And I'll show you one of their images. That, by the way, that principle of having a really large collecting area for light uh, is also what's used by uh, nocturnal animals this Tarsier, this adorable pygmy Solaris, these guys are small and frankly vulnerable nocturnal animals. The only way they can stay alive is to make sure they can see any predators. So they want to collect as much light as possible. So they have these big eyes to do it. JWST isn't worried about predators, we hope, but we're certainly trying to collect absolutely as much light as possible. And so for the same reason, you have the biggest possible eye that is the biggest possible primary mirror. That's not the only mirror that's there. Once light hits the primary mirror and brought to a focus, it doesn't simply come to the detector. And next, it hits this secondary mirror that's out here. And these booms, by the way, were folded up in flight and had to extend in exactly the right fashion. Once the uh, telescope is actually launched off into space, the light hits that secondary mirror and then bounces into this aperture here. And all the scientific instruments are in here. And this little animation here kind of shows you what's going on. So there's light hitting that primary mirror, bouncing off of that, going into the secondary, and finally hitting the detectors. There's detectors that both will actually make images. There's also ones that will simply detect the light and measure the spectrum of light. That is to say, measure which particular wavelengths are coming from the object you're looking at. Uh, for many astronomers, it's really the wavelengths that you're interested in, as opposed to necessarily having a picture. And I'll give you a really compelling illustration of that in just a little bit. So a complicated piece of optics, what kind of pictures do you get? Well, here's actually three images from left to right from different infrared telescopes that we put up in the past. And the rightmost one is a recent image from JWST, one that I actually did just as part of the calibration. So you're looking at exactly the same region of the sky. In each case, you're looking at a bunch of stars. And you notice in the leftmost one, they're pretty bored to say, OK, I, I guess those are stars, but I'll take your word for it. Middle one, actually the Spitzer telescope, you can see a little bit sharper, but look at the tremendous quality of the image we get from JWST. And that's really because of having a much larger mirror, the larger the mirror, the sharp edge image you can get. So we're really getting some tremendous effect coming from that. Incidentally, the resolution, that is the sharpness of the image that you see from JWST, it's uh, equivalent to seeing, a, being able to see a one cent coin, a penny, 40 kilometers or 24 miles away. So tremendously important. We're looking at things that are very much further away from that and much bigger, but still same kind of ratio of the size of the object to the distance over which you're seeing them. Having that ability to see small detail is incredibly important. And as you can see, JWST is working out super well on that. It's just been up there for six months, just a few days shy of that. They've not yet started doing scientific research with it. Just been going through the commissioning and testing stages. So a good question to ask is, what are we actually going to learn once we start doing these observations? So let's take a look at some of the science for which this guy was designed and some of the things we hope to learn about. One is one that I actually mentioned before. I said that comparing a visible light image to an infrared image, you can see through clouds of gas and dust. And those are regions which, as best we understand, that's where stars actually form. So we'd like to see what's happening inside, literally see what's happening in the star formation process. It's the analogy, for instance, if you're talking about the human formation process, if you're talking about what happens as a child is actually gestating in the womb, 
if you can actually see through there with ultrasound, then you can, say, you can see all the stages in the evolution of that child. We're trying to do the same thing. We're seeing through the womb, in this case, this womb made out of gas and dust, and using infrared to do it. You might ask, well, this is already an infrared image. Why do we need JWST? This is an image taken at wavelengths just a little bit longer than the visible. In fact, this is a, both the left and right images were made with the same telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble can see a little bit in infrared, but because it's not cooled, because it operates at pretty close to room temperature, it can only see a little bit into the infrared to see longer wavelengths and that the glow of the, of the telescope itself gets in the way. So we need JWST to see much more detail. Also because it has a much bigger mirror, JWST has a much bigger mirror than the Hubble does, we'll get about three or four times better resolution, be able to see that much more detail what's going on. Understanding where stars come from is pretty important because we orbit one of them and we'd like to know more about its origin and hence how it's going to evolve. And so star formation, very important. Another thing we'd like to do is actually look for planets that are like Earth. One of the most amazing discoveries over the last couple of decades in astronomy is that our solar system is not the only one out there. Our star is not the only one with, with planets orbiting it. We know actually literally thousands of other planets orbiting other stars. And not just individual planets, but in fact, systems of planets. The one that's shown here is a, a system called TRAPPIST-1. If you're a fan of uh, TRAPPIST ales, you will not be surprised. This was discovered by a group of Belgian astronomers. And they actually found it's a planetary system with seven planets orbiting a dwarf star, one that's much smaller and much fainter than our own sun, about 40 light years away. So images we take today, it's actually light coming that left that, uh, uh, that star in the year 1982. And interestingly, you notice those planets orbit really close in. They're actually, their, their distance from their parent star is much closer than the distance from our own sun to Mercury. So a bunch of apparently Earth-sized planets that orbit very close into their parent star. And we know about a tremendous number of these. How do we know those planets are there? For most of them, we've actually discovered using this technique. If a planet should happen to pass in front of its parent star, and its orbit is edge on to our, our field of view, then during the brief time that planet is in front of the star, the star will get a little bit dimmer. And then when the planet passes by, it gets brighter again. So to detect a planet like this, you'd have to look, stare, basically you just stare at a star that you think might have a planets around it, and you look for dips like this. A single dip doesn't tell you, you'd be looking for a periodic one, one that happens once per orbit. And by measuring the time from one dip in brightness of the star to another, you'll be able to tell the period of that planet's orbit around the sun. For Trappist one, they actually see a, a sequence of seven different dips at different time intervals. So they actually tease out from that what that planetary system must be like. Well, we know they're about the same size as Earth, but it'd be nice to know, are they really like Earth in the sense that you could actually have life existing on those planets? And at the moment, we have no idea. Well, what's interesting is that if you look at the amount of light coming from that sun, the parent star of the TRAPPIST-1 system, you find there's a certain range called the Goldilocks zone or the habitable zone where it's not too hot and not too cold, but the temperature is kind of just right. We could actually have conditions similar to what we find here on Earth. So in principle, there could be life on those planets, but how would you tell? And so the idea is to do the same kind of observations that we use to detect them, but now do using, using JWST. Stare at that planet, stare at that star, and as the planet moves in front of the sun, some of the light from that star will have to go through the planet's atmosphere. And as it goes through the atmosphere, by looking at the spectrum of light, you'll be able to actually determine the chemical composition of that atmosphere. And if that composition includes things like oxygen, or methane, compounds that are associated with life here on Earth, that's a good signal that maybe in fact these are Earth that are life-bearing planets and for all we know could have civilizations on them. So one really tremendous thing we may get out of JDOST is perhaps detecting some of the first planets that look like they could be potential home of life. Talking about planets, another thing that we might be get some tremendous information from, from JWST, is actually looking at how planets form. This is an image of a very young star. It's thought to be only about 100,000 years old called HL Tauri. The Tauri means it's in the constellation Taurus. It's about 450 light years away. 
And this is actually an image made on the ground with a telescope that's actually sensitive to microwave radiation. And the cool thing about that is you'll notice it looks like an uh, old-style phonograph record. This actually is a star that's right at the center, surrounded by a disk of material that apparently was associated with the formation of the star. As the star collapsed inward, not all the material collapsed inward. Some of it actually formed a disk. It's thought that planets actually form from such disks. It's thought that our own solar system formed from such a disk. That's, as we understand, is why all the planets orbit around the sun in the same direction. And while the plane of the solar system of all their orbits is all pretty much the same. Evidence that we formed out of a disk like this. But there's just not quite enough detail in this image to be able to really see individual planets perhaps in the process of formation. You need something with better resolution and infrared wavelengths are ideal for that. What's got excellent resolution and works in infrared wavelength, JWST. The planet formation folks are super excited to see some of the data they're gonna get out of that. And HL Tori will probably be one of their targets. There's lots of other similar planet forming systems we know about, and we'll discover a whole bunch more and learn about much more about them from observations made with JWST. But the real scientific payoff which is actually the one that JWST was principally designed for and why they selected the particular range of infrared wavelengths they did is to actually look at stars and galaxies in the early universe. Here's some actually Hubble Space Telescope images of relatively nearby galaxies, which as you can see come in a variety of shapes, different colors. The colors actually tell you things, by the way. You'll notice, for instance, in the galaxy at the lower left, there's some magenta or red colored blobs in there. And those are actually region where there's glowing hydrogen, apparently triggered by freshly formed stars that are emitting copious amounts of ultraviolet radiation and making the hydrogen glow. Actually, those are fluorescent light fixtures, because that's how fluorescent light bulb works, but they're fluorescent light fixtures that are light years across and are signals of star formation. You can also see dark lanes in those galaxies that are where there's dust, dust that may be, as I mentioned, be involved in the formation of new stars as well. So we can really see the life cycle of new star formation in galaxies like these. And of course, we live in a galaxy. I always think of a few years ago when Jay Leno was hosting uh, The Tonight Show and they asked people, what galaxy do we live in? And one person said, I think it's Galaxy 500. Said, no, that's a Ford. That's not our galaxy. We live in the Milky Way. So, oh, you mean the candy bar? Yes, like the candy bar. The universe is full of galaxies. In fact, here's a Hubble Space Telescope image where each one of those individual dots is not an individual star, it's actually a galaxy, each of which might have 100 billion stars in it. And in fact, it, the number of galaxies in the observable universe is about the same as the number of, of stars in our own galaxy, about 100 billion. So you can see they come in a variety of shapes, different colors, different sizes, and so on. What we'd like to know is, what were the first galaxies like? In the very early phase of the universe, what were the first galaxies like? What were the first stars like? Were they the same as the stars we see today? It's thought there were some essential differences. Today in the sun, our own sun is mostly hydrogen helium, but there's plenty of other elements as well. We find iron, we find copper, we find oxygen, we find the whole periodic table in there. But just after the Big Bang, the only elements that really existed were hydrogen and helium. And a star that's made out of hydrogen and helium, it turns out should have some very different physical properties. Have we ever seen any stars like that? No, because they only existed in the distant past. How can we see them? Well, it turns out we can see into the distant past, and JWST is designed optimally to see into the distant past. The thing is, the farther away we look in space, the farther back in time we look. And that's because we're seeing light that's come to us coming at the speed of light. And the further away something is at the speed of light, the more time it took for us to see that thing. Here's a simple example of that. Here's this wonderful photograph that's actually taken in Sicily, not by me. Uh, you can see there's a beautiful crescent moon and some stars out. Well, the moon out there, 400,000 kilometers away, at the speed of light, we're seeing light that took 1.3 seconds to reach us. So for instance, when the astronauts were on the moon, if you'd asked them the question, you'd have to wait for a response because it took 1.3 seconds for the radio waves to reach them. And they would think of their answer. There's another 1.3 seconds to answer back. So there's a noticeable time delay in that. The further away something is, the greater the time difference. If you go out and look at the, the brilliant sun, you're seeing the sun as it was about eight and a half minutes ago. Because at that distance, 150 million kilometers, you're looking eight and a half minutes into the past. Up here at the upper left in this picture, that bright red object is the bright star Antares. It's 555 years ago, which means the light from that guy 
said 555 years to reach us, which means we have no clue what's happening on Antares right now. We know pretty well what happened 555 years ago in the middle of the 15th century. We have no clue what's happening there now. Galaxies, even the nearest galaxy to us, the Andromeda galaxy is 2 million light years away. So we see it as it was 2 million years in the past. That says the further away something is, we're able then to look further and further into the past. So part of what we want JWST to do is to look really far away and it's really far in the past. And that, it turns out, is why it's optimized to be an infrared telescope. To see very far back in time, we need an infrared telescope. That's because you might say, wait a minute, does that mean the galaxy is really far away? We're giving off mostly infrared light? No. We had thought that like today, they were giving off most of light. It's visible and ultraviolet wavelengths, which is typical of the galaxies we see in the nearby universe. But why do you need infrared? And the explanation for that, why you need an infrared telescope to see things that are giving out visible and ultraviolet light is because the universe is expanding. Many of you are familiar with the idea that the universe is expanding, has been expanding ever since the Big Bang about 13.6 billion years ago. One notion that many people have, oh, that means the universe is, is a, a blob of material that's expanding into some empty space around it. No, our best understanding is that the universe is actually infinite, always has been infinite, and it's simply becoming more infinite. And what's literally happening is that shape, that space itself is expanding. If you think of the universe like a big, instead of three dimensions, think of it in two dimensions, like a rubber sheet. And out very far away, people are stretching that rubber sheet. If you had any dots you had drawn on that rubber sheet, they would spread away from each other because the size of the rubber sheet would expand. And the same thing's happening to the galaxies. The galaxies themselves are not getting bigger. We're not getting bigger as time goes by. If we are, uh, it, it's our own fault. It has nothing to do with cosmic expansion. But space itself is expanding which means as you look at objects further and further away, that means the light waves coming from them have been traveling through expanding space. And because they're traveling through expanding space, their wavelength itself increases. If you think of drawing a wave in a rubber band and you now stretch that rubber band, that wave's gonna stretch out, the wavelength is gonna increase. Well, the same thing happens to a light wave traveling from a distant galaxy. If it takes a billion years to reach us, that means over a billion years, if it's a billion light years away, it's been a billion years of time for that wavelength to actually increase. We actually see that more and more distant galaxies, their light shows up at longer and longer wavelengths. In the visible range, the longest wavelengths are the red wavelengths, and that's why we call this a red shift. And it's called the cosmological red shift. Because of that, if you want to look at really distant galaxies, even though they may have been giving off mostly ultraviolet and, and visible light, due to that stretching of light waves, as they've had billions of years to pass through space, their light is now predominantly in the infrared, precisely in the range that JWST was tailored to actually measure. So it was really designed to be able to measure those earliest stars and earliest galaxies. And in fact, it's tuned so that it'll be able to look back to times about 100 to 250 million years after the Big Bang. The universe now about 13.6 billion years old. We're looking at a fraction of that amount of time after the Big Bang. And that's, it is thought, is when the things just got cool enough finally from the expansion of the universe that stars could begin to form. So we're hoping to be able to see the very first stars that formed in the history of the universe and how the first galaxies formed out of those and really see the details of that star and galaxy formation. I wish I had a picture of that for you. We don't have those pictures yet, but come back for the next talk on that. After we have a bunch of data, let's check back in a couple of years, and I guarantee you JWST will have some amazing data as to what happened about not just the formation of the first stars and galaxies in the universe, but also about properties of how stars formed, how planets formed, and if there are, in fact, any Earth-like planets that show signatures of having life on. I assume there's a few questions at this point, and so I'll just sort of end it right there. And again, any questions, feel free to air uh, email me at airboy at ucsb.edu. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Roger. That was fascinating. Well, I've got a question or two yes. to start with. Okay. So the hexagons in the mirror, yes. are those individual hexagons individually flat and or are they curved and where they intersect each other? Do they have to do some kind of corrections so that you don't have a distorted image there? How do, they, yeah. how do the hexagons work? Yeah, each individual hexagon is in fact curved. It would be nice if we could just make a flat shape. But no, that each of them has a very careful curve that's done with them as well. 
Uh, I should mention, by the way, those hexagons are made out of beryllium. Mm-hmm. The reason they use beryllium, it turns out beryllium is much more reflective of infrared light than other metals are. Uh, beryllium is also incredibly toxic, so you don't want to be in the room when they're grinding those mirrors. So that's, that's all done using machinery. And then at, you might worry about those, those hexagons actually uh, causing a, showing up at the image somehow. Mm. But the cool thing about telescopes is the shape really doesn't matter, nor does it matter to have those jagged edges. One demonstration that I, I've done with my students teaching astronomy is uh, I'll actually take a curved mirror, uh, the sort that you might use to say a shaving mirror, and use it to form an image and say, okay, what's going to happen if I cover up half the mirror with a piece of black paper? Some people say, okay, the top of the image will go, no, the bottom of the mirror the image will go, and so on. And when you do the experiment, you cover up half the mirror, and the image just gets a little dimmer because you're collecting half as much light, but nothing else about the image changes. One way to think about that is those, in terms of the optics, is that those intersections between the hexagons are so out of focus that none of that ever shows up. Great. I also wanted to comment that both Dave and I worked at the plant that makes Kapton. Oh, very good. So in Ohio, so cool. I don't so, know if the Kapton came from our plant or not, but <laughs> I, but, but this kind of yeah, but again, an application that I'm sure when you were working on that stuff, uh, never imagined that it would end up uh, you know, out at L2 uh, acting as a sun shield for a, for a, for an infrared telescope. That's pretty cool. All right, and um, when you said space itself is expanding, yeah. how f- is it expanding faster or less fast than the speed of light? How uh, fast is it expanding? Uh, so it's expanding at a, actually, well, actually the rate at which it's expanding has changed over time. Uh, for about the first nine billion years of the history of the universe, the rate of expansion was slowing down. And ever since then, it's actually been speeding up. And you can see that by looking at distant galaxies and see, looking at how bright they are compared to what their recession rate is. So it's really bizarre, our understanding, you kind of understand why it would slow down because you think the galaxies would be attracting each other by gravity, that would tend to pull things back together. But it turns out there's another effect that we don't understand at all from this weird stuff called dark energy. Mm -hmm. It kind of acts like an anti-gravity and pushes stuff outward. Ever since about the last four to five billion years, dark energy has actually been the dominant form of energy in the universe. And it's actually caused the expansion of the universe to increase in speed. Uh, to answer your question, is it possible for things to move away from each other faster than speed of light? Absolutely. But it turns out things that are moving away from each other faster than speed of light, as a result of that, they can't actually communicate with each other uh, because they're so far apart. The light from those things will essentially never reach us. And so there, there's no contradictions with special relativity with that. It's, I'm happy to say. What other questions do we have? Hey, Roger. Uh, yeah, it's, it's Gordon. Uh, nice lecture. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, can, can you explain again uh, why the telescope orbits L2 rather than uh, is placed in a stationary position here? Right. Yeah, part of the, if you actually had it at L2, there would be times where the sun and, and earth would actually, because, uh, because the earth's orbit is not a perfect circle, there would be time where um, the earth would actually blot out a part of the light from the sun you essentially get some eclipse happening onto the telescope itself. That would cause a change in the ambient temperature on the sunlit side, which would cause a change on the telescope side, and you're trying to avoid any kind of thermal fluctuations whatsoever. The other thing it turns out that L2 is not actually a stable point. If you actually wanted to keep something at at L2, it'd be really hard. So it actually makes more sense to have stuff orbit around L2. Another thing, it turns out it's not the only thing out there. There's at least two other spacecraft that are out there orbiting L2, which trying to do the same thing, always keep one face pointing away from the sun and earth and moon. The good news is they're in very different orbits and space is big. Uh, so, space so, is big. <laughs> so, so, so in, a, in a sense, the, uh, uh, the, the air traffic control out there is well regulated so they uh, avoid any, any mid-space collisions. Great, thanks. Bob, you have a question? Yeah, in regard to seeing the other planet, the planets on other stars, mm-hmm. you mentioned that it only worked if we were looking at them edge on. Right. So that means that there's a whole bunch of planetary systems that we're not able to observe at all. Is that exactly. correct? Exactly. That's exactly correct. Yeah. Uh, there are some others we can see using different techniques, but, but those as well need to be either edge on or close to it. So you're right. There's a whole bunch of these planets. We, uh, with current techniques, we will never be able to detect. 
The good news is just by staring at a, a random patch of sky, we've actually been very successful at seeing tremendous numbers of planets. And so we're getting a good, lots of good statistics. And so it's thought that what we're seeing is probably representative of the planetary population as well, including not just the ones we can see, but the ones that we can't see as well. Daniel, you have a question? Yeah, uh, the uh, L3, L4 point where it is, is there some onboard collision avoidance or is that totally from the ground and you just send commands saying, you know, thrust a little left or right to avoid this other Russian spacecraft or whatever's yeah, out there yeah, in those points? Yeah, there actually is one Russian one out there and one European one as well. But yeah, yeah, yeah but uh, uh, the, the good news is the, the average space between these things on the order of hundreds of thousands of kilometers. Mm. So, uh, so, so the... Um, so you don't, that's one, that's one thing I always worried about on Star Trek, the fact that the Enterprise has anti-collision lights on it. Uh, and, and JWST does not have anti-collision lights, uh, they're that, that not that close. But, 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 but it's all regulated from the ground, exactly. Nice. I would just say it's very sparse compared to low Earth orbit where there's all kinds of stuff. And you actually worry about debris hitting, for instance, the International Space Station. Yeah. Uh, out, of, out at L2, uh, it's pretty empty. Uh, my question is kind of a follow-up to Daniel's, yeah. where I think Daniel said, what, move, move left, move right. What's the frame of reference that's used? Because, I mean, we're spinning around, things are orbiting. I mean, do we go by the sun as being the, uh, the origin point? And we use, I mean, how do we map our solar system? Sure. And, good, and yeah. have directions, yeah. yeah. And, 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 of course, for JWST, you uh, it's, it's, it's really doing all of its observation thing outside the solar system. And so there you're really using the same coordinate system that, that ground-based astronomers use. And so it's, it's based on the North and South Pole, and, and that's the grid that you, you fix. Uh, the, the one problem that you have with having a, a Earth-based thing like that is uh, because the Earth is, the orientation of the Earth's axis is not fixed, it slowly changes direction. Every couple of decades, they have to actually readjust all the coordinates. Uh, when I was first studying astronomy in college, everyone was using uh, 1950.0 coordinates, and Hubble, Hubble was the first one to change over to using 2000.0 coordinates, and it, probably in another 10, 15 years, they'll start worrying about changing over to 2050.0 coordinates. Really, for all this stuff, you use the same. So when you, when you say where something is, uh, the coordinates are actually all based on the Earth's north and south pole. Let's see, there's a question in the chat. What would happen if the speed of light traveled faster than the expanding universe? Well, it's, it's certainly true that, well, in, in some parts of the universe, uh, for instance, uh, between here and, oh, let's talk about something relatively nearby, like 100 million light years away, which on the cosmological scale is pretty nearby. Yeah, there the expansion is far slower than the speed of light, which is why we can see those things as well as we can. Whereas things that are, you go farther and farther away, and you get to stuff that is receding at near the speed of light. As a result of that, the amount by which the wavelengths have been shifted is tremendous. In fact, uh, here's an experiment you can do. If you, if you still have an old style TV in the back, not a flat screen, but an old cathode ray tube TV that's in the back that you've been needing to throw away and haven't, uh, go ahead and plug that in and turn it on and set it to a channel that's not broadcasting. And if you think back to what it was like when you would do that, you'd see all this hash on the screen. And most of that is actually coming from terrestrial radio sources, other broadcasting stations, mm -hmm. so on. But 1% of those dots is actually radiation that your TV can pick up that's actually the afterglow of the Big Bang, which has been redshifted through the expansion of the universe from a very high temperature of about 300,000 Kelvin down to temperature about 3 Kelvin, just above absolute zero, which means all that stuff has been shifted out in the microwave part of the spectrum. And so you actually can pick that up. And the fact that we see that microwave radiation coming from all parts of the sky is, in fact, one of the key pieces of evidence that the Big Bang, in fact, happened. But that really is the afterglow. It's been redshifted way out of the ultraviolet and all the way down to the microwave part of the spectrum, far beyond the infrared. Daniel, do you have another question? Yeah, I did. Um, danger from uh, micrometeorite impacts and or uh, cosmic ray hits on the local onboard electronics. I, is that pretty low? Uh, it's pretty low. Cosmic rays actually uh, are, are, frankly, can sometimes be an issue with ground-based telescopes as uh -huh. well. Because uh, uh, the detectors they use are 
their electronic detector is not too terribly different from what you'd have in a digital camera or for that matter in your phone, uh, much, much more refined, of course. And they, they be able to work in the infrared, they use a different chemistry, but it's the same basic principle. So yeah, cosmic ray hits is certainly there. Uh, so for instance, for ground-based astronomy, one way they'll get around that is they'll take an image of whatever they're looking at and also do one essentially with the lens cap on. And that's called the dark exposure. And you'll get some, some pixels showing up on the screen, actually triggering even a dark exposure, either due to noise, either due to cosmic ray hits or whatever. And so you subtract the dark from your image and that gives you something that gets you more like the, the pure information. In, in terms of micrometeorite stuff, uh, that's just there and it sort of is to be expected, but it's thought that, for instance, even on the telescope, for the same reason I was mentioning before that the, the intersection between the hexagons don't have any measurable effect on the image, even if you got a hit or two on the telescope mirrors, which obviously are totally exposed to space, it's not going to have much degradation on the image at all. Well, Star Trek or Star Wars? Yes. <laughs> yes, both? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I, I, you, know, you may have seen the, uh, uh, the, the, the T-shirt with a picture of the Enterprise that says Star Wars number one fan. And so I'm kind of in that category, but yes. Lost in space, though, no? Um, it, it, it's all good. I, I will say, since we're getting off into that stuff, yeah, it, it's, it's quite remarkable, you know, having someone who grew up in the 60s where anything that was even remotely science fiction on TV, you would watch it because it was just there. Mm -hmm. uh, and now there's so much stuff, you actually have to do triage to decide, okay, there's so much good science fiction on there, which am I going to watch it, and which I simply not have time for. So, I'm way behind in my Star Trek series, oh yeah. so oh yeah. way as behind. Am I, as am I, but yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Wayne, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. on the um, heat, heat shield, is that Captain like covered in gold or aluminum or something, or is Captain just really reflective? Uh, they, they do, I think it does have, an, it's aluminized. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a polyamide material. Yeah, it's just, it's just like a dark orange in the form I've seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's yeah. also a question from Donna about when we might expect the images in scientific research. Uh, and uh, it, it's going to be a while yet. Um, typ typically for any of the NASA stuff, um, you, rather than things being immediately released, since the way, the way the whole process works is folks, uh, astronomers, and this actually happened several months ago, actually put in their request for observing time. I uh, say, I wanna look at this, here's why I would need this many minutes or hours of observing time, here's why it's important. And then there's a, a TAC, a time assignment committee that will go through and look and say, okay, that's a good idea, we'll give you that amount of time. This is pretty good, we'll give you half the amount of time you're asking for, this one, go back and, uh, try us next time. It, it's not a great idea. But once that data is collected and actually goes to the scientists, then they need to do the science on it. It's not, it's, it is nothing like the movies where you see a picture and say, oh my gosh, I know exactly what's going on here. Instead, you have to turn it over to your graduate students who do all the work and really analyze and see what's going on. And only then will, will they come back and actually do a press release through NASA. And often that'll be embargoed like don't release any of this information until such and such a time. So these guys who actually did the, the analysis, they can actually get their paper out and, and get credit for the work that they did. So there's always a bit of a time delay, but just search on the web for JWST science. And I, I guarantee you more and more stuff will be coming out over the next, uh, the next year. What are you most looking forward to? Uh, it's, it, really, all of this stuff is really quite amazing. And I, I wouldn't say there's any one that, that yeah, Again, sorry to sound a little Pollyanna-like in the same answer I gave you for Star Wars versus Star Trek, but it's all good. And what I'm really looking forward to is the stuff that uh, turned out to be a complete surprise. Mm -hmm. And what that will be will, in fact, be a complete surprise. Daniel, you have another question? When they get the infrared data, they're going to do a color transformation up to visible spectrum. Is there a standard that's followed among the astronomy community is how you relate what colors to what temperatures or? No, no there, there is not. There, uh, and so, uh, and also here, because we're working at, in wavelength ranges where there's not been a lot of recent experience, I'd probably have to come up with new false colors, uh, but there probably will become a JWST standard for that. But, but what that is, uh, uh, that, whether that's been decided in house, 
at Space Telescope or at, uh, at ESA or NASA or, and I should, uh, uh, not to give short trip, but also CSA, the Canadian Space Agency has been very involved with this, with, with the development of uh, JWST as well. So all those folks will probably have some sense of that. But what, what the color scheme will be, I'm kind of hoping for that fuchsia will show up in there, but we'll see what happens. Well, whatever it is, if you actually read the details, the images, they'll tell you what it is. So Roger, or Gordon again. Um, so there is a finite life as far as being able to direct a telescope in terms of how much propellant you have on board. Right. And I understood that because the launch was so efficient and the placement was so good that uh, there actually was additional propellant beyond what they expected that it in effect will extend the life of the, uh, of the telescope. Can you, can yes. you uh, chat on that a little bit? About yeah, that's the, my understanding as well. They, they did a really good job of positioning in exactly the right spot using the Ariane launcher that was able to do this. The reason, by the way, it was launched using an Ariane from uh, French Guiana is that as opposed to launching it from the Cape is because this, this are, as you can imagine, it's pretty heavy payload and so you need all the help you can get the get the stuff off the off the Earth's surface. Well, French Guiana is closer to the equator than than the Cape is. Consequently, just due to the Earth's rotation, you get a little extra takeoff velocity, mm. and that that's actually why Ariane can actually lift into space heavier stuff than uh, than the American boosters can from uh, from Cape Canaveral. But again, they they targeted things super well on the way out. And we're able to use the, uh, the, the actual uh, booster to get it exactly on trajectory, which means I had to use very little of the onboard propellant with the uh, JWST itself to get it out where it is. I should mention as well, and you can see it from uh, the image here, which I'll enlarge a little bit here. You can see there are these flaps hanging off the back of JWST, and those are actually um, for steering. And I said, wait, where, where's, there's no wind. You're like a space. rudder. How does that work? But <laughs> what they can do is actually use the pressure of light because uh, light has energy and light also exerts pressure. And you apply a little bit of light pressure and that can be enough to provide some steering as well. Like a radiometer. Exactly, exactly. Great. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, what kind of portion of the whole sphere can it look at? Is it like a hemisphere or? Oh, uh, yeah, in terms of the pointing about, I think it really can point uh, in, in terms, you know, well, relative to the sun shield, that's interesting. I don't actually know how close the sun shield it can point. Uh, the good news is because of the way the, uh, the spacecraft orbits around, um, certainly anything that's near the plane of the, of the solar system, uh, no problem pointing near that. The question is how far off the ecliptic plane, that is the plane as its orbits around the, the sun, you could actually point. And I don't actually know the answer to that one. Um, I would think that they, they should be able to point it off to 90 degrees, uh, but I'm not actually sure. That's an excellent question. All right. I think that's all the questions we have. Roger, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I Very really good. appreciate you coming back and giving us this talk. Looking forward to maybe having you back when we have some of the research data and some of the That's exciting cool. discoveries to share with us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Judy. All right. Yeah, I just want to talk uh, briefly about some upcoming events. I'm pretty excited about some of the events we've got coming up over the next couple of months. So uh, we're going to do a, a potluck picnic uh, Saturday, June 18th, similar to the picnic that we did in December and in April. Bring a dish to pass. It's going to be at Stowe Grove Park, Area 2, noon to 3. Uh, and then on July 16th, Professor Mario Garcia, UCSB Chicana and Chicano Studies, talking about Central American refugee history in the current state. And then on August 20th, we're going to do the uh, premiere of the Inherit the Wind event. And uh, introducing that premiere will be Dr. Andy Thompson. He's an evolutionary psychiatrist going to be talking about uh, Darwin's impact and then leading into the uh, Inherit the Wind performance. In September, Babu Gojaneni is a leader, uh, an activist, a humanist, a rationalist from India, talking about superstition and religious challenges in India. And then in October, Dr. John Wathi's coming back and talking about his new book, The Phantom God, Neuroscience and the Compulsion to Believe. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks again, Roger, for uh, speaking with us again. It's really fascinating. My pleasure. Thanks for it was just amazingly well put together. Thank you.
Well, thanks.